We are the coalition. Of course, we are outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media. This is Coalition version 2.0 broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Media Network here on Go Local Live at Nanny Way Bassett Street in the heart of the city, the naked city, where there are, in fact, well, especially since we've started programming here, a few thousand stories that we can tell you. Joining me live in studio for the first time. Incredibly enough, I don't know why this never happened before, but is my friend and someone that I have a great deal of admiration for because if there's someone who's civically disobedient, it is this gentleman. And if there's someone who takes it personally, it's this gentleman. I'm talking about none other than Warwick activist Rob Cote. How are you doing, Pat? Good, good to be to, with you. Good uh, to meet you, buddy. This is finally. This is great. Um, channeling my inner... All the conversations on... The, on the cell phone and, and off air. This off, is, off uh, air. This is good. And kind of cross conversations through a certain <clears throat> late night, after, late afternoon mm -hmm. uh, talk radio host, <clears throat> Dan York. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in fact, the first conversation we ever had um, was on the Dan York Show. was on the Dan York Show. Uh, he was interviewing me, and then he put me on hold and said, I'm going to bring this gentleman in, Pat from Cumberland. And we had a lively debate, and I said, Hey, I'd really like to talk to you. So, Contact me at uh, my email, contactsrevolt at AOL.com, and 30 <laughs> seconds later, I got the email, and 30 uh, seconds after that, we've been chatting. Right. So, and by the way, if you want to drop a dime, and if they, as they say in the vernacular, now, first of all, let's explain that. Tony, do you know that term, drop a dime? No, before my time. Okay. Dropping a dime, that's an age-old journalistic term used for when, believe it or not, the payphones dotted the landscape. And a payphone call only costs a dime. <laughs> so you would drop a dime into the payphone, to leave, shall we say, a uh, perhaps a scurrilous, uh, perhaps unfounded or founded, uh, rumor, uh, assignation, um, uh, perhaps a few details about a, uh, a city or a state walker who, uh, you know, those details probably you would not like to make private under your own name. So, if you're, particularly if you're in Warwick, the man to drop a dime. In fact, if you Google Warwick, drop a dime. Well, you need to have a whole sack of dimes if you're in <laughs> Warwick and you near a payphone. <laughs> the one that's left. A roll of dimes just won't do it. That, th there you go. So, uh, first of all, let's talk about Rob Cody. I mean, you, there's multiple issues you've addressed out in the, out in the public landscape. And, and a lot of it comes because you have a significant area of expertise in engineering. So talk, talk about your background and, and the type of work that you do and how it's translated into civic activism at a very high level. Well, by trade, I was a professional diver by trade and I uh, was a scuba instructor and owned my own uh, uh, Naui Pro facility and I was a charter captain. And uh, I was having a lot of fun as a, as a licensed charter captain and a licensed pilot, owning a dive shop, getting paid to do what I love. And I, was, I did uh, some time as a commercial diver. And I had various training in non-destructive testing and inspection. And at the time when uh, the diving industry started to take a turn with the advent of the internet sales, uh, my inspection business started to take off. So I kind of had to follow that road and follow the money stream. And I kept moving forward with my education in construction management and uh, uh, non-destructive testing and third-party inspection. And I happened to get uh, very fortunate. I was trained by some of the best guys in the business. And so I got into the Boston market where, again, I, you know, education is never enough. I continued my education. And so I've been exposed to, uh, you know, construction for the last 25 years as a third-party inspector working as the eyes and ears as the engineering uh, uh, expert in whether or not the code is in compliance or not. Mm -hmm. So my my specialty now and what I've been doing for the last 20 years, 25 years, is code compliance for construction. Um, I do specialize in high-rise construction, power plants, um, uh, pressure piping, structural steel, uh, the welding code, things of that nature, but I, I've been uh, very much accustomed to general construction, street construction, road construction, bridge construction, and a lot of bridge construction. And um, so I've been noticing as, as you know, in the state of Rhode Island particularly, th there's all kinds of deviations from how we're supposed to be building things correctly. And, and let's face it, I mean, all you have to do is look around with the Rhode Island DOT and you can see historically that's probably been the case where we've had an organization that's for 30 years been a dumping grounds for individuals that knew a guy and mm -hmm. got a job, but nothing's ever been done the right way. So hence Rhode Island's in the 
the form that it is. But more particularly, I, I, I think I, I started to be outspoken as a resident because I started to see a lot of social decay in the neighborhood I grew up with. I, I grew up in Warwick. I've been there 57 years. I raised my two beautiful daughters there, Carolyn and Courtney, and uh, great kids. Uh, couldn't use the Warwick school system because it's in such decay. Mm -hmm. Had to spend 120 grand for high school and more money for uh, middle school. But, um, you know, I, I really started to get vocal when uh, Governor Kacheri, when on his way out the door, he allowed the cities and towns to reduce the exemption for the mm -hmm. automobile tax right. from 6000 to 5000 I think that's where you and I had our first conversation with Dan York. 99% um, <clears throat> of the people that weren't paying attention got caught by surprise, and I was one of them. And I'll tell you a quick funny story. In 2011, this happened. It took place in, uh, it was instituted in 2012 because, as you are aware, the car tax is a retroactive tax. Um, you are taxed on the previous year's days of registration on your vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if your vehicle was registered for 120 days in 2012, you get that bill in fiscal year 2013-14. So when the exemption was reduced from 6000 to 5000 allowed uh, the cities to do whatever they wanted, uh, you know, Warwick uh, incurred an extra 32,000 tax bills. And, you know, I, I pay my taxes, I pay a lot of taxes, and I'm never late with a, with a bill, it's just the way I am. And I, uh, I would always go to the city hall and pay my taxes. So when I went in to pay my automobile tax, there was a tax for a trailer, a boat trailer, and it was being taxed on a value of $3,000. The boat trailer uh, is for an inflatable boat that I have <laughs> that I bought brand new six years prior to that for $875, brand new, with the certificate of, of purchase and so forth. So I said, wait a minute, this is wrong. I'm not going to pay this tax. And I went down to Walk City Hall to the tax assessor's office, and I asked the gentleman, I said, listen, I have this tax. And he said, well, you know, uh, trailers and things of that nature, they're just subjective. And he said to me, uh, I said, well, where's the book value? He said, there's no book value. We just assign a value. And he looked at me and he said, and quite frankly, Mr. Cody, most people, they just pay their tax and don't complain like you. And that, wow. that pissed me off. And I said, I'll be right back. So I went home. I got the, the, the documentation, uh, the bill of sale, and I presented it to him. And I made him actually do his job and, and rebate uh, the fees that they mm -hmm. wanted me to pay. It was, I don't know, 75, 80 bucks. Wasn't the point. When he looked at me with the, the, the level of arrogance that we find with the majority of our city workers, municipal workers, that you know, we're doing them a favor, and said to me, most people just pay their taxes, don't complain about it, that lit the fuse. And up until that point, I was pretty quiet. That was probably the most expensive tax bill the city of Warwick has ever issued. Yeah, Mayor Abedishian can thank his assistant tax assessor for that one. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, it's you know, it's laughter filled with irony. I think you and yeah, I are coming. Because from I got to tell you, if that, if the gentleman had not made that comment to me, there'd be no war of car tax revolt. And quite frankly, the state of Rhode Island wouldn't be talking about car tax reform. Because I went home that night, and I was on fire. And my wife was, you know, what's got you now? And, and I told her the story, and, and, and she was pretty disturbed about it. I said, here's the deal. I said, I'm going to spend $10,000, and I'm going to show this guy that he just pissed off the wrong taxpayer. And then she blessed herself, went in the other room. I heard her mumbling some stuff, and, and, then, uh, <laughs> and then it started. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I put together a plan that, you know, I said to myself, you know, the only thing that uh, in, in Rhode Island that politicians and city government understands is public humiliation. So here we go. So, um, you know, I went on a campaign, got, gathered some people together, got some signs, and I said, well, let me do this the right way. We're going to go to the city council. We're going to request to get on the docket to speak about this subject. And, and that's what we did. And um, uh, that was in 2012, August of 2012. Uh, finally, through uh, multiple months of humiliation, the mayor decided that we better increase the exemption because this guy's not going away. Right. So in 2012, they increased the exemption to $2,000. So everybody says, oh, you know, big deal, $2,000. The car tax, as we know, is still disproportional. But when you break it down, it's 2017. That increase of $1,500 that went back to the taxpayer now 
six years later is, is about ten million dollars right. in the city of Warwick that has gone back to the taxpayer. There's not a seated politician that can say, hey, I got ten million dollars back for you people right. and here's how I did it. Mm -hmm. So the ten million cost me ten thousand. I think that's a pretty good return and it, it was the point that you know, I can afford the tax pat and so can you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the point is I'm being taxed on a fictitious value that somebody just arbitrarily makes up. And, and that's what really bothered me. I don't mind paying the tax. I know we need our taxes, but I'm not going to pay a tax on a fictitious value that can't be justified by any intellectual means whatsoever. Right. So uh, it continues now. You know, we have another fiscal year, so we're going to have about another million and a half bucks back to the taxpayer. But I'm not happy with that because it's so disproportionate that, that, that there's, there's, there's a lot of people, like I said, 32,000 extra tax bills went out. So those are people that have vehicles that, you know, were worth less than $2,000. Those are our most sensitive residents in the city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had, uh, we, we had a, uh, uh, hearings at, at the City Hall. We had a rally at City Hall. We got hundreds and hundreds of people. First time City Hall was packed in the history that I've been in, in the City of Walk. And, and uh, prior to walking in, a gentleman came up on a bicycle and, and he thanked me and we got to talking. And, and I found out that he was a retired war hero, did six tours of duty in Vietnam, was, uh, was partially disabled. He told me that he got behind, he got in a little financial trouble, got behind on his car taxes. So they revoked his registration and then a year after that they revoked his license and now he's on a bicycle. Well, that helps. So, so, so that really kind of really fueled my, fueled my fire even further to say, hey, you've got some real sensitive residents that, that this is affecting. And uh, so we've been pushing to have the reform, as you know, we've, we've, I, I wrote the first bill Mm -hmm. that Rep. McNamara put forth, which was held for further study. That was six years ago. We introduced the same bill, which was very simple, year after year, held for further study. The interesting thing that I've learned through this educational process is uh, when the General Assembly holds a bill for further study, <clears throat> there's no date when that further study is due and, and who has the responsibility to bring it forth. So the problem becomes that um, it, as you know, it, it's a game. We're going to hold it for further study. Hopefully these people will get aggravated and they'll go away. They, my father calls it the course of least resistance. If you build enough obstacles in government, the representative form of government quickly dies away. You, you exhaust people. Our government has gotten to the point where we've gone from a, a, a family structure that one person would work and another parent would be home. The second person chose to work, of course they were free to do so, but they didn't have to. The family structure supported children in their day-to-day -day schooling and their extracurricular life, helping to raise them. We've now moved to a point where the state sees us not as individuals, but literally, a, I always joke about a barcode on the back of our neck that needs to be scanned as many times as possible. We Credit card. We've been forced into a situation where a dual income is, for most people, is now a necessity. Absolutely. Um, unless, of course, and I, by the way, no offense to my friends in the Occupy movement, but when I talk about the 1%, I always say that the 1% is highly compensated state and uh, municipal government officials because there's an entire uh, kind of ruling class that's grown up over this generation where you've got folks with really no accountability who are highly, highly compensated. We'll talk about that later in the show. We talk about the growth in the Commerce Corporation. Um, but six-figure incomes based on political appointments with no accountability. Now, those folks, of course, there's a lot more options in life when you don't have to worry about things like health insurance or uh, state Lifetime pay, free health care. Right. Or, you know, the three or four weeks of your vacation. Um, and, of course, and, and I, I will not take shots at the, I'll call them the ham and eggers, because I'm a ham and egger. The ham and eggers in government life, you know, the folks who are washing dishes, mowing lawns, doing the hard work that so many of our social workers who bust their butt. I'm not talking shots to them. I'm talking about the professional government class that's, that's been created. They don't have to worry about these things. Right. Do They're they? protected. Right. It, 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 we've literally, uh, I believe the Soviet Union called them app, uh, apparatchiks. Um, you know, where, where you, again, we've created a, a super class of society exempt from concerns of the real world. All that's missing is the private supermarkets. We'll get there. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you've got 
these this group of people who are not no longer in a position to object because life is so demanding you don't have the time right I spent two summers away from my boat and away from my children that I'll never get back mm -hmm. going to the state house going to city council meetings going to vehicle value commission meetings arguing with people where you could have more of an intelligent conversation with a brick that's on the side of the road and, yeah. and you come to find out through this educational experience that our elected official, these people that are put in, put in these positions, they're really not that smart. No. These are not smart individuals. Mm -hmm. They go along to get along, and when they're asked specific questions that require an intelligent answer based upon fact and, 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 and founded uh, precedence, they don't have any answers. And I can tell you, you know, when I get on this bandwagon, and I continued the education with going to the Vehicle Value Commission meetings and access to public records and spending lots and lots of money to get documentation. I just became more and more aggravated seeing that the complete lack of accountability, um, this taxation is subjective at best. Mm -hmm. And because it's subjective, people are being put in a position where they're being taken advantage of. And, and, and that just got me more and more infuriated. And then, I'm a, listen, I'm a pilot, I'm a licensed captain, I work in the engineering field, and everything I've ever done my entire life requires the ability to recognize a problem, immediately come up with steps to make the solution viable, and then to institute the solution, okay? That doesn't happen in the state of Rhode Island at any level, particularly in the General Assembly. Um, the Vehicle Value Commission is <laughs> just laughable organization, nice people, but completely uh, a, a complete waste of time. And when I, when I began looking at the situation where, okay, I, I've got a vehicle that I, I might be able to get $2,000 for and I'm being taxed for eight or $10,000, you have to put an appeal and you go to the Vehicle Value Commission, and I find out that during this course of events, the Vehicle Value Commission has never found an appeal in favor of the appellant. So I began to look at that, and, and I said, well, who are these people that are representative of the Vehicle Value Commission? And, and I, I pulled Title 44, and, and I started to go through, and I find that, okay, there's seven members of the Vehicle Value Commission. And when I looked it up, in fact, there weren't seven members. There were four members. And there are supposed to be seven members, five which are uh, municipal tax assessors, one from the general public, uh, who also acts as an as a administrator, and then an individual from the Automobile Dealers Association who educates this body on what the actual value of vehicles are. Right. So for the, the six years in question, the, the Vehicle Value Commission was in direct violation of Title 44 and the ordinance that created it. And this went back to the Chafee days. And then we find out, you know, further down the road through these meetings, when you go and there's three people, there's four people, you walk in, the meeting lasts about 12 seconds, and you're not allowed to ask questions. They're not allowed to answer you. You can make a statement, and they look at you with death in their eyes. And, and I started to figure out the reason that is that every one of these people on this Vehicle Value Commission, their health insurance, their salary, and their pension, is directly related to the amount of taxation revenue that comes into their city. So there is no motivation for them whatsoever to do something that is, that is you know, uh, equitable for the members of the general public who are being taxed. So we started to look at each one of these people individual, individually. And then I find out that uh, one of the members, nice enough guy, had some great conversation with Dave Quinn, doesn't even live in the state of Rhode Island. So he had a pension from East Providence, and now he worked uh, in Providence as a, as a tax assessor. But he lived in Seekonk, Massachusetts, so he wasn't even obligated to the taxation formula for vehicles in the state of Rhode Island. So now when I look at Title 44, it says specifically that any member appointed to the Vehicle Valley Commission must be a resident of the state of Rhode Island. So the Vehicle Value Commission was completely broken. Chafee said he was going to fix it, didn't fix it. Raimondo said she was going to fix it, didn't fix it, but uh, last December she finally appointed an all seven member commission. And we finally have an individual from the Automobile Dealers Association on the board. 
Now the Vehicle Value Commission meets twice a year. They have a public comment meeting and then they meet to institute the presumptive methodology for taxing vehicles, right. which is the same every year. There's never any change. Meeting lasts about six seconds. Unfortunately, that individual that has been put in position from the Automobile Dealers Association to educate the members on the values of vehicles didn't show up for both meetings. Let me ask you a question. I, full disclosure, during the day, I work in the automobile industry. There are, and this is kind of an aside, but I'm really curious about your reaction because you, you do so many things at so many different levels in business. We have, what we live in, one of the most expensive states in America to own an automobile. You've got this uh, confiscatory tax on automobiles. You have a confiscatory sales tax on automobiles. Unlike most states, you are not allowed to deduct the value of a already purchased, already taxed vehicle to you know, as used as a trade to offset the purchase price of the new vehicle if, in fact, one of those vehicles is, is, a, placed, truck. is a truck. Um, you've got fire tax that are, you know, that are levied based on vehicle values. It's, it's expensive to own a car here. And in many cases, I, I, I joke about this, but it's definitely what you call a gallows humor. Uh, there are parts of Providence that look like old Havana as we piece together uh, some crazy cars like those uh, gangster cars, Plymouth, right, Tony? The uh, <laughs> older cars, you know, literally piecemeal in order to make it somewhat affordable. Big run up to a short question. In your opinion, why hasn't the automobile dealer uh, community gone bat bleep crazy? Well, I can tell you, I know a very prominent individual in the automobile industry in the state of Rhode Island. We grew up together from when we were about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And I approached him one day and I said, listen, the Vehicle Value Commission needs a person from the Automobile Dealers Association to be involved with this, to give feedback. And he said, I'll look into it. So we got together one night, we had a beer, and he said, Robbie, I gotta tell you. He said, I was told right out, if I stick my nose in this, I will never get another construction permit in the state of Rhode Island. He said, I've got too much quote unquote we're sitting at Bezos in East Greenwich. I have too much skin in the game. I cannot be involved. Now, we had the discussion. If the vehicle taxes were reduced and were equitable, you would see a dramatic increase in the amount of vehicle sales in the state of Rhode Island. Which, of course, then would be revenue positive because of the sales tax. sales tax. Correct. And in fact, is it true, and, be, and I'll, I'm going to ask you to confirm, in a sense, what I know because I've asked a number of state reps who were in power at the time, when in fact the exemption was ultimately dropped, you had no revenue analysis to see whether or not this would this move would even be revenue neutral, never mind positive to revenue to the state of Rhode Island. Right. That that was one issue where there was no further study performed. It wasn't held for further study. So we're not even sure, really, on a grand level whether or not this is revenue positive. Not that I want, listen, one thing, a little, little note here. You will never hear me rooting for the state of Rhode Island to get more revenues. I, you know, you, you, across talk radio, across the media, people meet every day, lives, we need to do this because it'll be good for the revenue. Screw the revenue, we got plenty of revenue. It's not a revenue problem, it's a spending it's a problem. problem. Exactly, so the entire foundation of this tax is built completely on sand, isn't it? Well, you've got to remember one thing, Pat. Rhode Island is drowning in unfunded liabilities. So, you know, and I've had this conversation with the Rhode Island League of Cities and Towns. Any disruption of the revenue stream, they look at as a possible disruption to a revenue stream that feeds their constituency. Mm -hmm. With their pensions, their health care, their sick time, their vacation time, on and on and on and on. We don't want to disrupt that revenue stream. To, to which, and here's some Warwick trivia, if I remember this so clearly, uh, back seven, eight years ago when we had these massive floods in Cranston and Warwick, our federal delegation, it was right around the time of tax returns were due. Uh, true story, folks. Our federal delegation intervened and got an extension for federal taxes to be filed uh, because we were declared a disaster area. That was April 10th. Right. And the reason I know that is because I was the pilot that did all the aerial photography on the flooding. Right. So now, that should be a good thing. 
The state of Rhode Island had to resort to expensive short-term borrowing because the triggering impact of a, a statewide exemption in the federal income tax, and of course, I mean, anyone who owed the debt anywhere obviously waited another month or two, triggered a similar cash flow issue on the state tax because we follow the federal laws. Correct. And pushed the, like I said, pushed the state into short-term expensive borrowing because we almost went broke. That's correct. And why did we almost go broke? Unfunded liabilities. Right. That's the problem. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I attended a council meeting a month ago uh, where we had the health care actuary in for the city of Warwick to discuss our health care plan. So our health care plan as of today has a $450 million liability. The plan has zero dollars in the plan building equity. Zero. The mayor of Warwick has not contributed a nickel. There is no money. I want everybody to understand that. No dollars, zero dollars, a $450 million liability as of today, 371 on the city side and the balance on the school side. And Councilman Marola asked the actuary, would it be safe to assume that this business plan is not working? And the actuary said, if this was my business plan, I would run away from it. And Mr. Marola said, well, how would you deem this business plan? He said, does the word insolvency mean anything to you? Now, that's just an one issue. Right, and, and let me point out, that number has nothing to do with the much more well-publicized pension issues. That's that, correct. That's, this is, you know, we're, you know, trillions underfunded in pension issues. That is one city, if you will, one municipality, one select set of employees. So the point is this, Pat, we keep giving it away, right? And everybody says to me, well, you know, the contact thing was good, but now you're ruffling feathers because you're, you're watching all this waste and abuse. Yeah, you know, when, when, I, when I see two, two city workers in a pothole repair truck that they pick up a ton of asphalt over P.J. Keating uh, for Route 37, and they drive around for eight hours, and they go down to Goddard Park, and they go park in the woods, and they hide out. And in the eight-hour time period, they never get out of the truck, and they never shovel an ounce of, of, of asphalt to fix a pothole. And then they go back into the, into the city compost station and dump it in the waste bin, and they do the same thing the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And this is all caught on video. And these people are not reprimanded, they're not fired, and they're not brought up on criminal charges. What that says is the environment is such that this type of behavior is not only accepted, but, but we, we, actually, we actually embrace it. We're not going to do anything about it. Right. When a city employee gets caught red-handed, when the detectives get tipped off, hey, this city employee, he's stealing today and they hide out in the bushes, and they catch the guy going into the city yard after hours, stealing a couple of thousand dollars worth of merchandise, and he admits to it, and he's stealing gas as well, they fire him in such a fashion as that they did it wrong so they can bring him back. Nine months later, they bring him back with full pay, full health benefits and everything because they said, ah, we, we, we fired him incorrectly. So what does that tell you? That says to these city workers, listen, we can do whatever we want, we're not going to be held accountable. And at any given time, I can go out with my camera and I can document this at any given time. And this is not that, I'm, that you know, I've got an ax to grind against this person or that person or the other person. I don't know who these people are. I know the truck numbers. I know where they hide out. When I have city employees calling me and saying, at this particular time, this truck is going to be hiding out in the woods at this location, and you go there, and there's two trucks and four guys, and they're ditched into the woods, I have to say, I'm paying more taxes. My car tax is supporting this. My property tax is supporting this. My business tax is supporting this. At one point, somebody's going to answer to me and, and, and tell me, look, we have to be accountable. And unfortunately, in the city of Warwick, much like the state of Rhode Island, you, you, we've seen it over and over. The people aren't accountable. I mean, the most recent, last week, we've got a Department of Transportation worker that leaves the state of Rhode Island, goes to Massachusetts, hides out in a parking lot, He's followed for months, doing it every single night. He wasn't fired. He wasn't brought up on criminal charges. He was reassigned. What does that mean? <laughs> so in private business, right. there's no such thing as reassignment. You're fired, 
And most likely you're brought up on criminal charges for either obtaining money under false pretenses or something else. But in the state of Rhode Island, we embrace the issue of the concept of being lazy and unaccountable for. He's parked on the job. Parked on the job. Best line ever. And, and, and it, it goes on and on. We've all seen it. And, you know, and I've all, all, often said to my, my, my dear friend Jim Hummel, if you had 100 Hummels, your work wouldn't be impacted because it's like shooting fish in a barrel in the state of Rhode Island. At every corner, you can find something, some type of negative behavior that's having an adverse effect on not only the quality of life, the quality of education, the quality of our roads, and the overall uh, wellness of our state not to continue to exhibit increasing examples of urban decay. And, and let's talk about the human cost of that. And you mentioned early on that um, and I am, <laughs> this bears a lot of uh, personal recognition for me. Um, you mentioned that you'd spent a large amount of money educating your children. Thousands, yeah. And, and I'm sure you have as well. Right. The, why? Because you want them to get a good education. You want them to have a better life than you. And you, want, you don't want your children exposed to an environment, case in point in Warwick, unhealthy structures, parents that maybe not take things as serious as you do, and an environment where the, the, the academic climate is such that your children aren't going to learn. For example, these are not my statistics, it's the Rhode Island Department of Education. In the city of Warwick, graduating seniors have a 17% proficiency in mathematics and an 11% proficiency in science. Teachers are the fourth highest paid in the country. We've got buildings that are run down, and now the city of Warwick wants to put another $85 million to fix the 60-year-old buildings that will have to be continually fixed and upgraded for their life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Now, I work in that industry. I've done probably 25, 30 schools in the last two years all over the line in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. They all have the same formula. We build a new school on the playing fields. When the new school is done, we demolish the old school and we build new playing fields. They're doing it for $350 a square foot, <laughs> and they're putting these buildings up, they're coming in on time and under budget. We can't do it in Walk. we can't do it in Rhode Island. So the problem for me is, here's, here's where my motivation comes to, to just want to tear the hearts out of these politicians that are destroying our, 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 the wellness and the health of our community, is I got two little girls that I love to death, and these are good kids. They excelled in athletics, in academics, in music, in the arts. They have really good friends. We've been very, very blessed. And it's going to come a point where I got real smart kids. They're going to leave me, right? They're going to go away. And, uh, and that's really not going to go well with me because I want my family around me. And, you know, my kids grew up. We spent an awful lot of time together. You know, my, both my children learned to walk on my boat, took their first steps on the water. Um, I, I don't think I've missed one of their, uh, I think I missed one swim meet that I still have to sleep with one eye open through the course of my, my kids' swimming careers. And, 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 and they're going to leave me. And the reason they're going to leave is because they're not going to find good jobs to be able to build a future because of the political environment within the state of Rhode Island. Right. I, have, I have two daughters that clearly have no intention of staying here. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing for them to stay here for. And it's heartbreaking because yeah. you want that Sunday dinner with your kids. You want, you know, you, you want the chaos in the house. You want the kids, the grandkids, all hell breaking loose. Crazy friends. Crazy, crazy friends. Yeah. yeah. You want all that because that's what life is about. But, you, you know, I, I mean, you, you look at these politicians that, that they don't care, you know? Well, uh, it, because quite frankly, none of this affects them. It doesn't. And they're never held accountable. No. When you're compensated at the level of some of these manager types are, particularly in the state of Rhode Island, um, you don't have to worry about things like the mortgage right. or health care or time off to go on those great vacations. What's a va vacation? I, I heard that concept. Is it true that some people actually get paid and they go on vacation? Yeah. About that. I heard about that. Yeah. I never yeah. got to experience, but I heard that that happens. See, Tony and I are charter members of the gig economy, right, Tony? We were gigging before it was cool. Um, yeah, it, it's... When I use the term educational holocaust, 
as it applies to this state, there are people who get highly offended. Do you think I'm wrong? No, I think you're right on the money. Absolutely. I can tell you a, 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 a funny story when it, w education. My kids spent, I think, uh, three years in public education in the middle school area. And uh, my daughter had to do, she was going to Windman Junior High School. They had a science project. You know, we've all done the, the solar system science project. And uh, the science project comes back. It should be $15. It was actually about $150 to do the project, so forth and so on. And I'm looking at, at the teacher's notes, and I'm finding that the teacher had, had uh, math errors in his formula. Excellent. Right? So the, you could not do, the kids couldn't do this because his formulas were incorrect mathematically. So I, I called for an appointment, and you have the 24-hour rule. And then I wrote an email, and I finally got an answer. The science teacher emailed me back. There were 15 spelling errors, uh, spelling errors in the email. So I took it like an English teacher, corrected them in red, <laughs> and I went down to the director of secondary education, Dr. Sangster. By the way, this is why we get along so well. <laughs> I banged on his door. I walked in the administration building with the teacher's email, threw it on his desk. I said, tell me why this should be on the front page of every English-speaking newspaper in the free world. So he looked at it and he said, uh, well, Mr. Cody, are you upset that the teacher didn't use spell check? I said, no, and I want you to try to follow me closely because <laughs> I know this concept is difficult. <laughs> I'm upset that the teacher needed to use spell, spell check. check. Right. Okay. He's not a laborer. He's not a carpenter. He's, you know, no disrespect, but he's a teacher. Right. And when the science teacher actually spells the word science incorrectly, you know, that's grounds to tear somebody apart. Or, rut row, Houston, we have a problem. Right. So, so those are issues that I think uh, <laughs> contribute to the social decay. But, you, you know, we, we've gone off on a tangent path, but I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to kind of oh, circle back. Well, let's just sum this up. It's um, Sue Carcheri, uh, Governor Carcheri's wife. Um, I don't know if she coined the phrase, but it, it brought it to my attention. The soft bigotry of diminished expectations. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We, we have learned to accept mediocrity in Rhode Island as if mediocrity was a level of excellence that we've never experienced. Because in so many cases, government in the state shoots for mediocrity. Medi mediocrity is their brass ring. And, and, and in closing, so I want to get back to the car tax. Is it here, I'm going to, uh, Counselor, is it fair to say that essentially the state of Rhode Island and it's at its higher levels looks upon civilians as a necessary inconvenience with which to finance their day-to-day -day lives. And at which they have, ha have uh, no accountability nor do they owe these people any answers to any questions that are, pr are put forth to them. Is it fair to say, Counselor, Your Honor, that in fact the highest levels of state government in the state of Rhode Island actually hold us in contempt? Oh, I have, I have seen that so many times when I have testified at the State House that you're looked upon as, as, as a pest that has infiltrated into their pristine environment. An annoyance. Yeah. Look, folks, take just a second. We are the Coalition Loud and Proud, outrage porn free. Tonight, we have reached a level of civilly disobe civil disobedience in the studio, heretofore thought impossible. I'm thinking, Tony, the only person missing from this room right now is Mike Riley. If the three of us got in this room, there actually might be a meltdown. Uh, <clears throat> Mike, if you're listening or you hear this on podcast later in the week, that means there's an invitation. I think, I think we've got the formation here of uh, perhaps something on a monthly or so basis we should get to, sort of a, a I'll call it the grumpy old men's panel. <laughs> hey, speak for yourself on the age. <laughs> okay. So anyhow, uh, joining me in studio, Rob Cody. Um, you know, he was doing, he was doing civil activism before it was cool. Um, he, uh, you know, listening to his calls, most notably, there's a chemistry you and York have that's um, scintillating, to say the least. Uh, I can honestly look the camera right in the eye and say that a lot of the, the tood that I've got came listening to Rob Cody hold forth on shows like the Dan York Show, uh, and across the uh, the fruited plain, if you will, of Rhode Island. So my hat's off to you, because clearly, as we like to say here on the show, he's someone who takes it very, very personally. Um, circling back then, the car tax. <sighs> so we have this confiscatory tax that's been become a political football over the past few years. 
Uh, most recently, Mr. Speaker uh, <laughs> won re-election by the, uh, I think the technical term is by the hair on his chinny chin chin. Um, but he knew ahead of time how many votes he would win by. Let's not <laughs> let's not forget about that particular. Uh, yeah, let's. Um, Facts. You know, it was right. So <laughs> we were promised. In fact, there was almost a. Um, I'll, I, I can't use the obvious vernacular, but there was a, a back and forth, a repartee, if you will, between our Governor Rolando and our Speaker Mattiello, who, in prior incarnations on the coalition, we used to call him Polly Walnuts. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, and the repartee would seem to be just sort of a, can you top this? Who was going to more quickly or more efficiently do away with the car tax? So it, if, if I'm correct, and please jump in if I'm wrong, the question was not if, the question was when and at what rate. That's correct. And uh, I was interviewed several times on, on several media outlets about mm -hmm. the speaker's comments about what he was going to propose and also on the governor's. And I, and I laughed hysterically and I called them both out on it for, for very simple fundamental reasons of due diligence. Mm -hmm. The first thing, and I'll, let me start with the speaker first. The first thing that really, really agitated me with the speaker is that the speaker plans, his plan, he's going to institute over five years. Now, I found that to be completely arrogant, how an individual who is elected for two years can put forth a plan that's going to take him five years, when he just won by 64 votes, which he knew they were in the bag in some closet somewhere, months before. Better so the arrogance <laughs> level that I'm going to fix something in five years when we don't even know where you're going to be in two years, that, that, that's, that spoke volumes. I was also um, uh, fortunate enough to have some lively debate with him on the Gene Ralicenti show where I asked him a couple of very pointed questions that required specific answers, financial specific answers that right. anyone who's done the basic fundamental studies of right. the automobile tax would know the answers to, and he didn't know the answers to. So I discarded him as refuse in terms of government solving of problems. Right. He does not have the skill set to do so, nor has he educated himself on the particulars of the automobile tax. And I can get into many specifics, but I'm, I'm hoping to have a one-on-one -on -one with him so I, 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 I can... I, I can pull out from him that he's a, just a bold-faced liar, period. End of story. I take offense when an elected official looks at me and gives me a line of horse manure that I know isn't true, that he knows that I'm smart enough to know isn't true, but he sits there with a smile and wants to, everyone else to believe that this is what he's going to do. When you know mathematically that he can't, one and one never equals 17. And you can tell me as much as you want that it does and be happy. But it, it doesn't. Now, his buffoonery could only be topped by Governor Raimondo's comments when she made the state of the state address, which told me that here's, here's a person that really, how she's a Rhodes Scholar is beyond me. And I will quote, because 10 minutes after she made the statement, I got a phone call from WPRO and from WJAR. We need to talk to you about this. Her quote was, this year, Every Rhode Islander is going to see a 30% reduction in their automobile taxes. Quote, unquote. Well, immediately, I flew off the handle saying, she doesn't even know how, how the car tax is structured. Because you, you can't say that. If she had said, we're going to do this type of repair and given some specifics, even general specifics, and that will result in next year, everyone seeing a 30% reduction, I would have had some respect for the woman. But when she said that, she didn't realize that the car tax is structured as a retroactive tax, which is based upon the number of days that your car is registered from the previous year. Mm -hmm. So let's say in a fantasy world, Governor Raimondo came through a budget and said, 30% reduction in car taxes. Well, at the time that she made the state of the state address, she didn't realize that the Vehicle Value Commission had already voted and put forth the presumptive methodology of taxation for fiscal year 2018. Mm -hmm. That's already in place. 
all the municipalities have already set their, their, uh, their budgets based upon that. And that if she had put this in the budget, you would not realize that savings until the following tax year. Mm -hmm. So for her to come up on camera in front of the state of Rhode Island and say, quote unquote, this year all Rhode Islanders will see, looked in that camera, will see a 30% reduction in their car tax was a calculated, blatant lie. Knowingly and willfully lied to the general public who 90% of the general public aren't in tune to issues like this, nor should they be. Right. They should have some uh, presumption that their leaders are going to be truthful. But we can see that this governor, she, in my opinion, she's a habitual liar. Because to, to do something like she did says either one of two things. Either I'm a calculated liar, or I, I'm just so inept that I don't even know how a tax is structured and I'm the governor of the state. It's one of those two things. Ask Don Grubbian right now how he feels about it. <laughs> right? One of those two things, and either one of those don't pan out to be correct. Right. They, they, don't, they don't put her in a good light. So <clears throat> this was my, my assumption, and I spoke to uh, one of the other talk show hosts this week, and I said, look, nothing's going to get done. I testified five weeks ago in front of the Senate Finance Committee. There were a number of automobile tax reform bills, four of which were on uh, the issue of trading a, a vehicle when there's a truck involved, which, which were good bills, but fundamentally they had some flaws, but they could be fixed. The other, the other bills made no sense whatsoever and, and would never be introduced. It would never even get out of committee. And the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee looked at me and said, look, Matty Yellow's plan on car tax is dead on arrival. It's dead. It's not going forward. We won't even hear it. And as of today, we've already found a $27 million deficit. That was five weeks ago. Now the $27 million deficit is 100, 110, right? But Mattiello is still saying, oh, we're going to fix it. A year ago, when Mattiello came out and said what his plan was, and then Raimondo came out, I said, here's what's going to happen. Mattiello is going to point at Raimondo and say she's the adversary. Raimondo is going to point at Mattiello and say he's the adversary. They're not going to get any car tax reform. They're both going to blame each other, and they're both going to be held like they're free and clear of any responsibility to the constituency. Well, you know, e either, either my crystal ball is right, or there's some big plan that nobody knows about. But as of today, there is not a bill in the House. There is not a bill in the Senate to do any type of car tax reform. It's not going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. And as we all know, Senator Ruggiero, who just put the ice, if you will, on the stadium bill, essentially confirmed just what you said, that if, if legislation hasn't already been before the Senate or the House, as the song goes, it's too late, too late, baby, now. So I heard from my state rep, who I get along with very well, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Joe Shikachi. Mm -hmm. We're going to have it, and, and, and he went to bat for me last year, put a bill forward, help for further study again. Uh, simple bill, a as you remember, Pat. <clears throat> let's just let's kind of rehash this for a minute. The 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 car taxes are based upon full clean retail, and one of the things I learned going through this process years ago that the condition of your car is not taken into consideration. Whether it's broken, doesn't have an engine, it's taxed upon as if it was brand new, pristine. So, <clears throat> what I said was, look, here's the situation. All you need to do is change three words in the existing legislation on the automobile tax, mm -hmm. from full clean retail to average trade-in. The problem goes away. It becomes fair and equitable. Mm -hmm. It's really about a 14 to 16 percent loss of revenue. You can handle that. You can suck that up somewhere else. And the problem goes away. People like myself are happy and everyone else is happy. You're off the hook. And, and let me point out a specific example. I mean, again, full disclosure, I work in the automobile industry. I deal with trades all the time. A very, very popular car is a mid-2000 older style Ford Taurus. Now, if you have a 2002 or three or four Ford Taurus, um, the auction value of that car is somewhere in the three to $600 range. And you're getting taxed on what, 4000 Yeah, depending on that, depending on how it's equipped. Mm. Three to four, I mean, that's real world valuation. If someone comes where I work, they've got a vehicle and it's got average mileage, typically 12 to 15,000 miles per year, no uh, body rust, on it, it's going to get three to $600 at auction. And by the way, you're going to have to take off delivery fees, auction fees, and everything else to get that. Mm. So essentially, most of the cars in this state that are, that are so, are, are essentially sheet metal. 
And we all know what's happened to the price of sheet metal lately. It's fallen through the floor. So you're, you're taking junk. And, you, and, and, and by the way, for all the good liberals, by the way, I love progressives, liberal Democrats to me, uh, not so much. For all the good liberal Democrats who profess to, and, and I'm of course including our governor, who profess to care so deeply about the quote unquote working poor or the visibly poor, for many of these people, this is the only type of vehicle they can afford in the state. So when you talk about a highly regressive tax. It's a slap in the face. Right. It's an insult. Right. It's an insult. And, 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 you know, and furthermore, Pat, let me say this. I said, to, I said to Rep Shikachi the other day, I said, look, you told me there'd be a bill in February. Then you said March. Then you said April. Then you said May. There's still no bill. Now you're saying to me, wait until the budget comes out. It's not going to happen. All right. So I, I, we know it's not going to happen. But the point is this. In the meantime, everyone is still being taxed. You're kicking the can down the road. You have noted politicians that have come up and promised the con constituency that we're going to fix this. Nothing gets fixed and you all go on vacation. So what message are you sending to everybody? So I said to him, there's only two ways you can fix it. You can move it from full clean retail to average trade in, or, and I said this on the air with Tara Granahan and with Bill Rapley, if you want to be a hero politically, it's very simple. Increase the exemption back to 6000 in phases, whether it's 4000 5000 6000 Increase the exemption. If you go back to $6,000, figure out what you owe the cities and towns and reimbursement so they don't just hike up the property tax, and you're all heroes. The problem goes away. Because at a $6,000 exemption, you, the, the amount that you're being taxed on your vehicle is actually equitable. And, and we're not going to have a problem with the semantics of, of how you got to that number because it's equitable. The problem goes away. You all look like heroes because you did something, right. right? They haven't done the fundamental studies to see right. if they did that, what would be our fiscal obligation to the cities and towns. Haven't done it. So I said to them, anything else that you try to impose as a reform of the automobile tax is going to require a completely new computer system and software. And I said to Joe, I said, how confident are you that the state of Rhode Island can roll out a new software program? Right, yeah. Given, given our track record. Given everything. And that's the facts. As you know, Pat, because you're in the business, the Registry of Motor Vehicles purchases the values of the automobiles from the NADA system. Mm -hmm. They import them. They produce the books that go to the 39 cities and towns. And that's all done on, on right. certain software. If we depart from the NADA value system, we need new, a new computer system for all the 39 cities and towns. Do you know that the vast majority of our elected officials in the General Assembly don't know that? And they're coming through with, with bills like, like uh, the, the, the rep from, um, from Westerly wants to put in a bill to eliminate the NADA system and use the Kelly Blue Book system. Not realizing that in doing so, you have to revamp 39 cities and towns, taxation formulas for getting that confiscatory tax into their coffers. And, and what does he hope to accomplish by using Kelly Blue Book as opposed to that? Uh, this is what I mean. They're just throwing stuff out there with no research. Look, I run my mouth a lot. Okay, I'll be the first person to say that. But I don't open it until I've got the facts and figures and I've done the research. You, you and I are, right. you and, in the words of the great one, the immortal Jack of Leeson, you and I are blabbermouths, but you're right. You don't hear us talking about issues that we're not fundamentally schooled in. And that you don't have facts, and then I can point to pages, facts, numbers, and paragraphs. So, you know, I've tried to school a certain amount of the uh, legislative assembly to say, look, here's your choices. You can do these pretty simply. Now, but bear in mind, this, this bill that I wrote, and I, I wrote this bill when I was at the, at the University of Rhode Island pool during the Bayview Invitational swim meet that my daughter was swimming and I had one lawyer on the phone, one rep on the phone. I said, here's what you're going to do. Real difficult bill. You're going to strike the word full clean value and you're going to put in <laughs> average trade in value. Done. Cleanest bill that's ever come across in the state of Rhode Island. Right. Done. All you need to do is figure out how much you have to reimburse the cities and towns. Right. Seems like a simple formula. But before you can actually institute this plan, you have to take the next step and do your homework and figure out how much will we reimburse Westerly, Warwick, Cranston, Barville, whatever. And, and, and here's what makes matters even worse. 
Unfortunately, what Don Cacieri did by allowing the cities and towns to adopt any exemption they wish between 500 and 6,000, he just complicated the matter. Because right now we have eight cities and towns that have the maximum uh, exemption of $6,000, and you go anywhere from $14.81 per thousand as a mill rate to $60 a thousand. And look at Providence, look at the people in Providence at 60 bucks a thousand. It actually came down two years ago with $70 a thousand mill rate. And, and they're driving these vehicles on these roads. The, the vehicles are getting destroyed. They're paying huge, a huge tax burden. Right. What are they getting for it? They can't even get their elected official to speak to them. And, and, and you know, I, I want my elected official to talk to me to, to 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 let me know that he actually understands the problem right. and understands the technical issues, but they don't. So, you know, my prediction, as I said to Matt Allen a couple of days ago that I'll bet you a case of lobsters and a case of Don Perignon that there is going to be no movement on the car tax. There can't be. There is no bill in the General Assembly now. So even if it was within the budget, you're not going to see any type of, 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 of uh, lifting of the car tax until the following year. So Gina Raimondo's statements, when she looked at that camera and said, this year, every single Rhode Islander will see a 30% reduction in taxes, how do we interpret her words? Does she have credibility? Not in my opinion. The operative right here on the coalition is balderdash. We're allowed to say that. I think you know what it means. Yes, and, and, and it seems to be that's the trend with the General Assembly and, and, and with, this, uh, with this governor. Is there, are there any legislative heroes for this issue out there at all? Is anybody, you know, kind of even, even, even in the darkest corners of Halitosis Hall, or is anyone you know, they, over here, over here, has anyone stepped up? Well, um, just be, and I've gone through three election cycles with this car tax revolt stuff. And in the months just leading up to the election, they're all heroes. They're all putting out color flyers saying that they're championing the car tax reform. Right. And, and that happens, you know, and, and they never even get it out of committee. You know, I had a senator in Warwick that every year would put forth that he's championing the car tax and we're, we're, it's unfair, we're going to do such and such. And not only did he never present a bill, but he never had a hearing. And, and none of them, well, I, I should say, Joe Shikachi has stood up. If anybody with Joe Shikachi stood up, he's come to the Vehicle Value Commission meetings. Not one other elected official has been to the Vehicle Value Commissions mm -hmm. or has testified in favor of a reduction. Uh, the first year, Joe McNamara came forth, but, but, but he didn't have a following behind him. Mm -hmm. and, and he put it forth, again, it was an election year, but, but where has it been? It's been six years. And he is, at least by title, the head of the Democratic Party. You can't, if you're the head of the Democratic Party, you can't claim in a state that's dominated by Democratic legislatures that there's some roadblock. If you want the roadblock to go away, you get to make it go away. Well, I would, I would have thought that Joe Mack, being in the position he's in for so many years, that he would have a relationship with Dan Beardsley and Peter Schaefer from the Rhode Island League of Cities right. and Towns. And he'd get together with them and say, hey, look, guys, you know, this, this is egg on our face. We've we got to do something about this. But every year, the Rhode Island League of Cities and Towns goes to the meeting, and I'll never forget when John Cannavale, the, that upstanding Rhode Island resident, <laughs> was the co-chair no of the here. <laughs> Municipal Finance Committee. And the League of Cities and Towns, Peter Schaefer, came out and said, look, you know, we need, we need more time to study this. Uh, we don't know how this is going to impact budgets, so forth and so on. And we're requesting, uh, you know, uh, this to be held for further study, and which it was held for further study. And the following year, when we had a hearing, I confronted Mr. Uh, Mr. Beardsley and, and Peter Schaefer, and I said, uh, so you asked for further study. Um, where's the further study? <laughs> Have you performed it? And are you, are you here to present your further study? And they looked at me as if I had three heads. Like, well, you have the nerve to ask us to actually come through with what we said we were going to do. Right. So there is no further study. Right. It, it, it's an empty, hollow promise that's meant to get yourself out of a difficult situation on probably some very sensitive legislation. And unfortunately, listen, I, I understand why people don't show up to these meetings. They're frustrated. I'm the same way. I'm frustrated. I don't want to go to them. You have other things going on. You, you, your work and your wife's work and the kids got athletics going on, the drop off to pick up. I get it. 
but nothing will change until the cities and towns, their town councils and city council chambers are filled with angry people screaming and yelling that they've had enough. And until that happens, when it happened in Warwick and we filled the council chambers for six months, you saw some real nervous politicians right. and you saw a nervous mayor that all of a sudden said, yeah, I gotta give them something. We're not gonna give them the whole pie, but we'll give them a slice. Maybe they'll go away. We got a little bit back, but we, you know, it, it still needs to be rectified so Rhode Island doesn't look like we're this confiscatory state that's just spinning the wheels, not moving forward. You've made no secret of the fact that you politically oppose Mayor Abadizian. Um For any one of a number of issues, budget issues, and I'll just start from there. How desperate is the situation in Warwick? Oh, Warwick is, Warwick is structurally bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Now, th this is great because we had Mayor Avedesian's health care actuary, the one that he hired, that mm -hmm. he paid, that he cut the check to for the actuarial report, which stated that Warwick has a $450 million deficit mm -hmm. and that the actual would run away from this type of business plan. Mm -hmm. Now the mayor just boasts in the Warwick Beacon that we have a $10 million surplus. Really? But taxes are going up again for the 18th straight year and we're hitting the rainy day fund for another $3 million. So that's like saying, look, I've got five credit cards that I owe $10,000 each on. I'm not paying them this month. I'm cutting them up. I'm not going to ever pay them. And so I've got a $50,000 surplus. Let's go have a party. So I don't, Mayor Abadesian is the master at deceptive accounting practices. Mm -hmm. The master. And he, he can spin it any way he wants. So, but, you know, someone that's in business, in, but if Mayor Abadesian was in private business and was the CEO of any company, he would have been fired a long time ago. Because every year his cost of doing business goes up. His services are cut, they go down, everyone's affected. Schools, students, uh, roads, senior citizens. We, we just closed a senior citizen center. We just took the, the most uh, vulnerable people that had a, a place to go. I don't care whether they were playing bingo or poker, whatever they were doing. And he closed it down because the place needed a new roof. Now, a month and a half later, he's boasting a $10 million surplus but we're raising taxes again for the 18th straight year, and you're hitting the rainy day fund for three million. That tells me you have a structural deficit, right? right. If you had a surplus, there would be no tax increase, and you wouldn't hit the rainy day fund. You would actually might even put a little bit of that surplus in it. Right, and, and maybe you'd make your health care payment that is long overdue that you've not put one penny into. And let me just say this, last year we had another tax increase, business and residential. The tax increase last year raised $4.7 million in revenue for the city of Warwick. 100% mm -hmm. of that $4.7 million, plus an additional $300,000, went to raises and bonuses for existing city municipal workers. Excellent. Wow. I, I, you know, how long can you go in that direction? Right? Uh, I'll give you another example. Last year, the city council voted to increase the sick pay, the unused sick pay bonus on the firefighters, you know, the scam that we all know about, right? Increase it. That you brought to light. Yeah, from 50% of their unused time to 75%. Now, we couldn't afford a couple hundred thousand dollars to put a new roof on the senior citizen center. We can't, we can't afford potholes. So we, we can't afford anything. Right. We cut every service line item in the budget last year. The firefighters went from $443,000 in fees that the city paid for unused sick time to $1,092,417.11. More than a doubling of unused sick time bonus. When you look deeply into that unused sick time bonus, there's a lots and lots of disturbing factors that come to light and, and when you look at the individuals, and, and I've got hundreds and hundreds of documents, you see coordinated trends of people that call out sick and that get paid for it, yet that sick day is not reduced from their accrued sick time. So we have no money, taxes are going, oh, and by the way, Pat, when you do the numbers, that $4.7 million, 140 firemen last year 
got this increase in the unused sick pay bonus. Right. The unused sick pay bonus increase alone amounted to 19.8% of the total tax revenue that was generated from increasing the property taxes. 140 men, 19.8% right. of the tax increase went to them in their pockets as a bonus. Mm -hmm. And Mayor Abadisha doesn't understand why I'm screaming. Right. And when you ask him a question, there's no accountability. When you put forth an access to public records, you get delay, delay, delay. No such records exist. Then you have to file a complaints with the AG. And then once you file the complaint with the AG, and at, at that point, then mysteriously, these documents appear that you can do some basic analysis with. And then once you file the complaint with the AG, and at, at that point, then mysteriously, these documents appear that you can do some basic analysis with. But the problem is this, and you know this, people don't have the time to do this, and it becomes frustrating. And, and I can tell you this, historically, my pulse was 117 over 65, and when I started looking into city stuff and watching what's going on as a homeowner in the city that I grew up in, my pulse went to like 159 over 97. It literally could kill you. You, 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 it, it's, it becomes consuming because at every door you open, there's another scam, there's more misappropriations of funds, there's, there's more deceptive accounting practices. And I'll give you another example. Last year at the budget hearings, we had, uh, I, I think it was two, two million in change in overtime that was due to sick time in the fire department. Mm -hmm. But on the line item of sick time, 35100 is the line item of sick time, they showed $12,000. No questions from the city council on it. So when I asked the fire chief, you have all the sick time, but you're only showing $12,000, he said, oh, that, sick, that line item only accounts for the non-uniformed people in the fire department, the secretaries and the guys in the fire alarm. I said, oh, okay. Could you point to the line item that indicates the sick time from the uniformed fire personnel? He looks at the mayor, the mayor looks at the finance director, the mayor says, Lynn, you want to take a crack at this one? They, they don't know where it is because they don't have one. And the mayor states, oh, we just roll that all into salaries. Right. Well, two months ago, the city council put forth a resolution that the fire department, as do all other departments, must itemize their sick time for uniform fire personnel. They put it in the form of an ordinance. 100% unanimous council support. Passed twice, went to the mayor, the mayor vetoed it. Went back to the council, the council overrode the veto unanimously. Budget came out, the mayor is in violation of the ordinance and they did not itemize the line item for uniform firefighter sick time. Now, it, do you think that the local, the local newspaper covers that? That should no be on so the much. front page. Right. No story. No, no story here. <laughs> <laughs> How does, and, and let's take a look at local elections for, for a couple minutes. You obviously had some fairly contentious elections at the General Assembly level in Warwick. It was it District 21 that uh, you had 30 or 40 people running? Yes, Eileen Norton, Bella Wilkinson. Right. Mm -hmm. um, allegedly, and this might be shocking to some if there's, you know, if you, if you have a, a, a trigger warnings here, uh, some of those candidates who announced might have been, uh, what's the term, straw dogs? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for other candidates to divert the vote away. Um, there was a very strong allegation circulating that the Republican candidate for General Assembly was, in fact, a straw dog for Ms. Wilkerson. Absolutely. Uh, you know, no to, question about it. To take votes away. And that all of this was somehow orchestrated by Mr. Abedishian's office in order to maintain ironically, as our former president would say, uh, ironically, uh, to maintain a Democrat. Absolutely. If you think that Scott Abadizian is Republican, you know, i got some swampland to sell you. He's as Democrat as Democrats go. And he's very, very close to the failed finance committee chair, former finance committee chair, Camille Vela Wilkinson, who was a disaster in Warwick as a councilwoman, as, as the finance director. Never questioned anything. And now we find out that you know, she made some massive blunders. But now, 
what she used was the Roadworks program to oust Eileen Norton. Now, don't get me wrong, I've known Eileen Norton since 1990. I trained her son and her husband how to scuba dive and, and her daughter-in-law many years ago. We were very, very close. And, um, you know, I told Eileen right now, you're on the wrong side of this issue with Roadworks. And, you know, she followed along the Democratic line with Roadworks. And Camille Wilkinson, who, who, who gives away anything, she'll give away anything. She used that as her platform. Scott Avedesian and several other prominent politicians put the straw dogs in effect to take votes away from Eileen Norton. And, uh, and they put Wilkinson uh, where she is now. Now, in fact, mm -hmm. in fact, Camille Wilkinson was in violation of all the city ordinances pertaining to political signs. Had them up too early, they were too big. She had them erected on uh, existing signage from buildings. There were no more than 16 square feet. There were multiple complaints to the building department by m large numbers of people. All fell on deaf ears. So, as Rhode Islanders would call it, is it work? Is that some form of banana republic at this point? You know, I hate to say it, but if you want to see uh, amateurs in action, mm -hmm. Warwick is the place to be. There, there is no accountability in Warwick. This is, of course, the city council that wanted the bad signs. Oh, now that's, that is not the entire city council. That was, that was <laughs> Councilwoman Donna Travis, right? right? The, that Harvard MBA. She comes in and she wants to ban anyone from having a sign. And then right. she holds a sign up that has spelling errors. I mean, honestly, you, you, can, you, can, you can go through the last six or eight years that I've been involved in and um, the things that we've seen taking place from violations of Open Meetings Act um, on the Finance Board, on the Retirement Board, at the City Council level. Um, again, there's no accountability. Now you've got a kind of a, a, a kind of a rough assemblage of, of, of activists. You've got Mr. Cushman, who is the smartest guy in the city. Right, Bob Cushman, yep. hands down, smartest guy, nicest guy in the city. You know, he, here's a guy with a master's degree in business finance. Works for one of the largest companies, you know, in the state of Rhode Island mm -hmm. as a senior financial analyst. We're not going to listen to him. We'll listen to the city council member that didn't get an eighth grade education, but has been there for 20 years. Right. She knows more than Bob Cushman, the, the Bob Cushman that has a master's degree in business finance. And, and just from the periphery, I've read a lot of the things she's put out. They're articulate, they're on point, they're crazy enough, they're factually correct. The math actually works, mm -hmm. and um, like yourself, this is something he does just because it's, you ready for this? Sit down, no one's drinking any beverage, hot or cold beverages, because it's the right thing to do. The right thing to do. <laughs> you know? And yet, he was threatened. Bob was threatened, I was threatened. Right. Um, anybody that's that. come out publicly in walk has been threatened in one form or another. Whether it's being harassed, whether it's, I mean, I, I, I've been I've been physically threatened, which which I kind of I, I just kind of I know it's working, right? I know it's working. Um, and Bob Cushman came as a, he's a gentleman. Um, he came and he did his research and he went through the appropriate procedure to get on the docket at City Hall to give a discussion about uh, pension unfunded liabilities. And when he did that, certain members of the city council and certain members within the city loaded it up with city workers. And it was like Animal House. They were cussing. They were coughing into their armpits. They were whistling. They were chirping. Uh, council president Donna Travis at the time, which speaks volumes, this Donna Travis is the city council president with no formal post-secondary education whatsoever. She makes sure that the screen for Mr. Cushman to project his PowerPoint presentation doesn't work. So he has to show, show it on the wall. In the meantime, the fire department is cursing. Say, Here's the rabbit. Right. Here's the finances. Right. Now, and, and at the end of the presentation, the finance chair and the council president, unable to articulate one question, and they're all telling Mr. Cushman, you know, he doesn't know what he's speaking about. And then what happens several months later, the actuaries come in, and they produce a letter stating that, and, and as a matter of fact, Councilwoman Vella Wilkinson, the finance chair, called him a hobbyist. He's nothing more than a hobbyist, 
and he produces his charts and graphs on his kitchen table. Now, Councilwoman Wilkinson said this while in front of her at the desk that day, the council auditor had sent Bob Cushman's report to the, to the pension actuaries who said, in fact, Mr. Cushman's portrayal of the condition of the pensions was accurate and, and, and on point. Mm -hmm. She had that in front of her, yet she took the opportunity to try to mock and discredit Mr. Cushman. Because, and, and this is a sensitive point to me, I got into a, a bit of a, a Twitter battle uh, today with a member of the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation. And he uttered the words that I love to hear so much, that I'm negative and I'm a cynic. Aren't those insults the last refuge of scoundrels? Listen, when, when you don't have any facts to counter your opponent's assertions, then we resort to attacking the messenger. Right. And that's what happens in war. I'm attacked on a regular basis. But here's, why, here's what happens. I'll come out with facts and figures that are based upon analysis from actual city documents, and someone will come and attack me on that, but has absolutely no documentation to substantiate their position. And when you want to hold them in a, in a form of discussion, look, it's okay to argue. In construction, we argue all the time. But we don't leave the room until we have a solution, right. right? But in city politics, if you disagree with anything, you're a hater. You're one of those people, you're a hater. Either you hate the firemen or you hate the DPW. Right. It, it's, not, it, it's not a personal thing. This, this is all purely based on mathematics and budgetary issues. So it, 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 this is not a personal attack against any person, well, with the exception of the mayor. Because if the mayor of Warwick, Scott Avedesian, worked in the private practice, He'd be sacked in a heartbeat. Let, let's, let's just take a look at it for a minute. Walk is upside down. He's been there 18 years. Who's he got to blame? Yeah. Fire department's going over budget every year. This year they want another million dollars. The mayor's budgeted them another million dollars. Who's to blame? He's running the show. Can't blame Obama. Right? Can't and, blame and, Bush. You know, and, and, I, and I, fi I find it interesting, you know, as you know, that Scott Avedesian was on the board of directors for the Rhode Island Resource Recovery. All of a sudden, out of the blue, he quits. Two weeks later, there's $75 million missing. Don't know where it went. No, no investigation, no FBI, nothing. Everyone held free and clear. He was chairman of the board of, of Ripter. So now he becomes chairman of the board of Ripter. At the time he became, and I did an extensive amount of research. Wait, you got to say it right. Ripter. Yeah, Ripter. <laughs> <laughs> I did an extensive amount of research on, on, the, on the Ripter situation. When Scott Avedesian became uh, on the board of directors, they had a one and a half, about a one and a half million dollar deficit, mm -hmm. right? Six months later, there's coats hanging in the cash room where all the cameras are, and all of a sudden now they're eight million dollar deficit, and now Scott Avedesian is no longer chairman of the board of Ripton, right? Scott Avedesian was on the board of directors for the Interlocal Trust. So when we had a discussion about how we could save money, in our healthcare program in the city of Warwick, Scott Avedesian puts forth, no, I want the Interlocal Trust to manage our healthcare. That was a $3 million gift to the Interlocal Trust. So it, when you're looking at these things as a business person, right, because I own my own business, I'm responsible for everything. When you look at this management of a municipality and, 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 and the taxpayers' funds, in the private sector, he doesn't have a chance. Now think about this for a minute. People say to me, how come you don't run for mayor? I said, well, number one, it's a cut and pay. Number two, if you think I'm going to put up with someone like me for 100 grand a year, you'd be out of your mind. <laughs> right? Right. Think about it. Scott Avedis is making 100 grand a year. Unless he has other sources of income that are funneling money into some Swiss bank account somewhere, would you put up with that for 100 grand a year? Would you put yourself in that spotlight? And that amount of time and aggravation to deal with a municipality that's going down the toilet for a hundred grand. You know why you you know why you do that for a hundred grand, Pat? Because you got no other place to go, not in the private sector. So you're going to hang on to this job until you grab your pension, until some other political appointee job comes up that you've brushed elbows with and you've made your relationship with over right. the years. That they walk you out the door as mayor and give you another gig, because certainly. This man will never work in the private sector because someone's going to look at him and say, oh, what have you done in the past? Well, see, 
I bankrupted the city of Warwick. <laughs> there was 75 million missing on my watch at the landfill. And by the way, there was eight and a half million dollars missing from the cash room when they had the cameras covered with the jackets. But I'm good. I know what I'm doing. My, uh, my, and it's, it's, in one sense, on a numbers basis, it's minor league, but on a human, on a, on a fundamental level of humanity, it's, it's appalling. He was in charge of Ripter when they took away the free ride program. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I'm a libertarian, and I believe in little or no government, but we've got to massage our way there. And the notion that there are people in Rhode Island who are literally cannot get to a free meal because they have no mass transportation. And by the way, one of, in one of, I think, the more nefarious little plots, it was Scott Wolf's Grossmart, Rhode Island. His, one of his uh, coat hangers then went, now remember, this is Grossmart, Rhode Island, advocates for mass transportation. It was one of his henchmen that went and testified at a Ripter meeting run by Scott Abedesian that testified in favor of eliminating the free ride program, which is a five or $600,000 a year program that utilizes an underutilized asset in the state anyway. And so that's a kind of carelessness, uh, cavalier approach to government that, that really is the, really the hallmark of Scott Abedesian. You know, I couldn't imagine waking up every morning, looking in the mirror and saying, who do I have to buy off today to keep the only job I've ever had? Mm -hmm. I can't imagine it. Um, but I see that this man is turning municipal workers into millionaires on a regular basis. You know, every firefighter that, 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 that retires is a millionaire. These guys are going on 85% pension. They're walking out the door, the last chief that retired, $126,000 a year, 85% pension, free health care for life. Uh, you know, the, these salaries are so grossly inflated. And there's no accountability. Case in point, these guys retire, <laughs> and, and, and people that work for a living, uh, if they don't know, they're probably throwing up. They retire, they all leave with 140 unused sick days that they have to get paid for. And they all leave with the maximum amount of unused vacation days that they have to get paid for. So last year we had six guys, I think six or seven firefighters that retired, and the unused sick time was $287,000. So here's what happens. Because we don't have a line item to pay that, they're actually like, they, they, they work it so they're kept on the books, even though they're retired. So our fire chief retires, $126,000 a year, 85% salary, lifetime health care, unused sick pay, unused vacation day, and he goes to North Kingston and applies for the job as the fire chief down there. So. No one's really looking at the impact of what these dual pensions are doing to the state of Rhode Island. You retire from municipal service in the state of Rhode Island, bye-bye. You don't get another job. Go to the private sector, go start a business, go do whatever you need to do, okay? And, and that doesn't happen. And with the lack, that coupled with the lack of accountability, your unfunded liabilities go through the roof. And nobody looks at it. It's, you, you know, and if you comment about it with factual evidence, you, you know, you're a hater. You're a troublemaker. We've only got a couple minutes left. Um, and we've run over. And I want to, first of all, I want to thank you very much for coming in the studio. My pleasure. We're going to make this a regular thing. We're going to have some fun with this. Um, there's a couple of people I want to get together in one room and just to, to let her rip um, because we are kindred spirits and, and approach a lot of things in very much the same way. Mm -hmm. um, which is that sort of take no prisoners attitude is so critical at this point, at this juncture in Rhode Island history. In the minute or two minutes we have left, what's your message to the taxpayers of Warwick? And what do they simply have to do at this point? Well, I, I just feel that, you know, everyone in the community has a certain responsibility to hold your elected officials accountable and that the checks that you write you should know where they're going and how they're being used. If you're happy with that, stay home. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and uh, hit the potholes. Don't go to the senior center. Uh, be happy that your taxes are getting increased every single year. And, 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 you know, live with blinders on. If you're not happy with that, 
if you expect a different quality of life, if you don't want to see continued increasing urban decay in your city, then as a resident, you have the responsibility for yourself and your neighbors to go to a city council meeting, get involved, and at, at least on whatever particular subject matter might be your fancy, to make an argument, right? you got to make an argument. And if you can stand up and make an argument that will be articulate and to the point, maybe these council people will start to pay attention. We have a new city council in the city walk right now where I think we're going to go places with. I think we have some intellect on this council and they all seem to be on the same page. And I'm very, uh, I'm hopefully optimistic that we're going to see some changes. And mm -hmm. I can already see with the new finance chair, uh, Councilman Ed Lattisaw, um, you know, he's holding some accountability um, during budget hearings where he's saying, look, you're requesting money. I want to see you follow the proper procedure. Let's look at this. We'll study it. And, and if, if it's workable, you'll get what you want. If it's not, sorry, you know, you, we don't have the money. So that attitude ha has been void from the city of war for decades. So maybe a new seed has been planted um, or maybe, you know, maybe it's the writing's on the wall that everybody knows. You know, Walk is going down the tubes, right? Just remember what the former mayor of Providence said. I'm leaving the city of Providence in fantastic financial shape. <laughs> it wasn't a, a class three hurricane, right? It was a, a class, class five, five hurricane. hurricane. And where is that person? And, you know, and, and, and let me close with this point. We have no one to blame but ourselves. You keep elected Cicilline, you keep elected Langevin. The roadworks thing, right? Everybody went crazy on roadworks, mm -hmm. right? I thought you had four coronaries on roadworks mm -hmm. with everything that was going on. The screaming, the yelling, the talk lines were jammed up. We elected every single person that voted for, for roadworks with the exception of Eileen Norton. Somebody, we put them all back in order. Somebody bigger margins. Right? And you deserve, so you deserve what you get. You want to keep electing a guy like, like uh, the uh, uh, John uh, No Story Carnavali? Right. You're going to keep electing him? I, I mean, every election cycle, you look in the General Assembly, and either someone's getting dragged out in handcuffs, or there's an FBI investigation, or somebody's stealing condoms from the local supermarket, and it, or, or who's got a DUI. It goes on and on, but we keep electing them. So until the residents of Rhode Island have had enough, we, and we clearly haven't, you keep electing the same people. and. What do they say? Uh, you know, you uh, you expect a different result, but you you know you keep putting forth the same people, right? How can people get a hold of Rob Cody if they want to drop a dime, they want to talk about it, or they want to get active and help you out? You can always send an email, contactsrevolt at aol.com, or you know, at my phone number is no secret, four zero one seven. Yeah, that's the old business number, four zero one nine six five seven nine three four. I answer my phone all the time. Um, I would just encourage people to pick up the phone and make a relationship with your council member. Mm -hmm. Call the mayor if there's something you see that you don't like. It's, it's always good to, to question. If you see something that doesn't look right, it probably isn't. Ask a question. Is there any question in your mind in closing that if people weren't outraged instantly by the thought of this 38 stadium coming back to life, that we wouldn't be have a, have a bill passed right now. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, this is just, uh, I think, it, much in part to you with the, with the stadium situation, uh, you've brought to light, you know, a, a lot of good information, um, and you've you woke up a lot of sleeping people that there's just no more that the taxpayer can take on the chin. If it's such a good deal, then the owner should invest in it, right? If it's such a good deal. And why? For the why do you need us? Why, for the love of God, are we supporting, through the Commerce Corporation, we're going to talk about it in a minute, uh, my next segment, but why are we essentially subsidizing competitors to homegrown Rhode Island businesses? It makes no sense. And bear in mind, look, the Pawtucket Red Sox is the farm team for the Boston Red Sox. They got deep pockets, right? They got deep pockets. Go to them. Hey. This guy Ryan, and again I'm a capitalist. I, you know, I applaud his success. His last year as CEO of the CVS Corporation, he made 62 million dollars. Mm -hmm. All right, God bless him. You know, he reached the pinnacle of American business. So, 
my, I'll leave you with this question that you can dwell on on the ride home. Why does Larry Lucchino, Mr. Ryan, and the entire sordid cast and characters of Hashtag 38 Stadium think they're entitled to your and my money? Because you're going to give it to them because the, the past performance of, of the people in the state of Rhode Island, they're anesthetized. They're not going to do anything. They're not going to hold their public officials accountable. The public officials are going to give them that money to somehow curry favor with them. So down the road, there, there'll be some other, some other reconciliation for what we did for you in the past. Right. And One hand washes the other. They both wash the face. And as talk radio hero Charles and the Bucker would say, Solly Boy and Lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, absolute my pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, you, we'll we'll do this regularly. Anytime. And, and, and you have anything you need to send to the people? You, you just want to amplify. You're certainly your own unique voice in Rhode Island itself. But you know you got an open door here. You don't even got a call. Walk by. We've had two weeks in a row. We've had young members of the uh, Rhode Island uh, Utes twerking for us. <laughs> the Utes, right? Mm -hmm. Twerking for us here, and, and we applaud that. Um, but uh, you just, it's an open door. No, great job. You take a lot of time. People don't realize the time that you have to take away from your family mm -hmm. to make a point. And, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of other things you could be doing, you know, me as well. But you do it because you find something that you feel in your heart that it's not right, that it's going to have a negative effect on, on your quality of life, on your family. And, you know, and I'll close with saying, when my two daughters that I love very dearly move away and I'm home alone, the politicians in the state of Rhode Island better watch out because you're going to see someone on a rampage. And if you think if you think I can make you miserable now, that when, when I have free time on my hands, and I've said this before, pray to God that I've got 70 to 80 hours a week work because in the absence of that, I'm going on a tear. You're going to be cranky. I'm going to, you're going to be bored. And I'm going to, I'm going to bury pissed. you with access to public records, and, and I'm going to make it public. God bless you, lad. Thanks, buddy. All right. Take Rob care. Rob Cody. <clears throat> Activist, patriot, family man, business owner, and all around.